All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, uh, we would definitely be remiss if we didn't recognize our veterans out there today. So from uh, all of us here at Horner Automation, we really do appreciate uh, all the service that uh, you veterans have provided us as Americans, and we just hope you have a, a great day. And uh, we're quite honored if you've chosen to spend part of your Veterans Day uh, with us here at Horner. So let's go ahead and get started. Today's agenda. Before we dive into some of the creative ways to use the Horner all-in-one controllers, uh, we thought we would spend just a couple minutes reviewing kind of what a Horner all-in-one controller is, what a Horner OCS, um, and how it's traditionally used. Uh, we'll talk about our entry-level product line, the micro OCS, and our more mainstream product, the XL series, and how they're both traditionally used. And then after that, as a, as a baseline, we'll dive into some of the ways that the Horner OCS products can really act as a flexible device to help you solve a variety of automation problems. So we like to think of it as that handy dandy automation multi-tool. And we'll give you multiple examples of ways that you may not have thought of uh, to apply the Horner OCS all-in-one controllers um, in applications where maybe a PLC wouldn't be your first choice, uh, but a Horner OCS is a excellent choice in many of those cases. And as I've mentioned, you've always got an opportunity to ask questions and we'll get those answered at the end of the session. So what is a OCS all-in-one controller? So OCS is an acronym, stands for Operator Control Station. Um, it's a Horner specific product name. So it's been the product name for the Horner all-in-one controllers really since they were first introduced back in the late 90s. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been more than 20 years since uh, our very first Horner OCS product. But effectively, the Horner OCS products are all-in-one controllers. So they can combine the functionality of a PLC and an HMI in a single compact component. So they have extensive control and logic capabilities. They have built-in I.O. Uh, with the ability to add additional I.O. remotely. Uh, most Horner OCS products feature a built-in operator interface, although you can uh, purchase several of our controllers without a screen, but they're most commonly purchased with an operator interface built in, usually a touch screen, but not always. Uh, they have tremendous communications and networking capabilities, part of what makes them versatile. So again, those four elements, control, I.O., operator interface, and networking is what makes a Horner OCS all-in-one controller. and our products are configured with a single software package as well called Seascape. And really they're a great option in nearly any application that would traditionally use a PLC. But then later in the program, we're gonna talk about those applications where you might not normally use a PLC, but an OCS could be a great fit. Okay, so let's start with the micro OCS. And I guess, again, these are traditional applications, a lot of these at least. Um, and what is the micro OCS? Well, it's an all-in-one controller again has those same four elements i just talked about but this is our entry level product line so really it starts at just a little bit over 200 uh, for a full all-in-one controller with a built-in operator interface and networking and all those sorts of capabilities and here's a list of a lot of the really typical type applications that the micro ocs is used for so pump control is very common fan control metering of chemicals uh, mixing of chemicals, dispensing machines, really what we would describe as simple applications. Not totally basic, because there's still a whole lot of capability in this product line, but what we would describe as simple applications. As you move into the XL series, with this product, uh, it's still a tremendous value, but it is priced somewhat higher than the micro series. This is a very wide range product line, ranging from two inch units all the way up to 15 inch units. And really some of the same types of applications you'll see on this list here that we just reviewed with the micro OCS, but in general, there's something additional about them, maybe additional 
resolution or speed is required. Uh, maybe it's just more, more logic requirements, more memory requirements, faster speed requirements, more I.O. requirements, uh, whatever it happens to be uh, that makes the Excel series the best choice in that application. And, and as I'm showing here, um, a, lot of, a lot of applications uh, where our products are used. Uh, oil and gas is a very typical application for the Excel series. So you'll find it on offshore pump control and the chemical metering of oil and gas type chemicals, for instance. Um, another uh, scenario with the Excel series is that it is quite capable from an environmental specification standpoint. It has really good temperature specs. Um, and so you'll find it used in applications sometimes that are outdoors or applications where it might be on a shipboard or where 12 volts is important because the XL series is powered from 12 volts. So you'll find it with mobile equipment, shipboard equipment, those sorts of things. So again, uh, these are more typical applications for uh, the OCS products, not necessarily what we're talking about in terms of the Swiss Army knife type functionality. Now let's get into today's program in a little more detail. So what do we mean when we talk about the Horner OCS all-in-one controller as an automation multi-tool. Well, one of the things that makes the Horner OCS unique, especially when you compare it against a traditional PLC, is that it has a lot more built-in functionality. First of all, it has a built-in operator interface, which you don't typically find in a PLC. That's a pretty basic thing. The OCS always has multiple serial ports. No matter how inexpensive the model, you've always got at least two serial ports. Well, what would those be used for? Well, there's still a lot of equipment out there these days whose primary means of communications, besides maybe real world IO signals, is through an RS-232 or an RS-45 protocol. And the serial ports that are built into the OCS can interface with a whole variety of these devices. And now as more and more of these devices support ethernet type protocols, the OCS also has very extensive support for multiple Ethernet protocols. So that's another thing that makes it very versatile. Whereas with some PLCs, you'll have multiple protocols, but with many of them, uh, a manufacturer will pick a particular protocol and say, this is the one that we're going to emphasize and you're not going to find much else built into our product. Because of, in part, because of our place, you know, as a accessory maker, as a smaller US manufacturer of automation, we don't have the ability to dictate to our customers what protocols and what networks they should use. So we do a pretty good job of supporting multiple Ethernet networks compared with some of the major guys. All of our products also have built-in memory card slots. Okay, that can be pretty versatile. Not only can you use it to maintain the machine for loading programs and saving uh, and cloning units and those sorts of things, but you can do things like data logging and other type functions that again, PLCs are not necessarily known for because they typically have a somewhat limited internal memory and they have traditionally depended on third party devices uh, and third party software programs to handle any kind of data logging requirements. The Horner OCS has a very versatile web server built in, which is not necessarily something that you see in every PLC. With a lot of PLCs, or HMIs, you'll have a pretty limited web serving capability for remotely monitoring what's happening on the machine. Uh, with the Horner OCS product, our WebMI product, or feature I should say, gives you the capability of setting up web pages to meet your specification with whatever resolution and whatever data you want on the screen, uh, viewed remotely, grabbing data from the Horner all-in-one controller, and that screen uh, that you're looking at remotely on your phone could be completely different than what you'll see on the front of, let's say, a four inch OCS or a six inch OCS screen. So that gives it some really nice capabilities uh, to be able to remotely monitor uh, the equipment. We've also started adding new IoT based protocols to the OCS product line. The first one being MQTT Spark Plug. So that gives you the ability to push data using this MQTT protocol. And we've had a couple of webinars on this topic. So if it's something that you're interested in, feel free to go to our website and check out a couple of the recordings of those previous webinars. Uh, but with those capabilities built in, now you can use the OCS to push factory data 
up to a cloud or just to a local server in your plant. So all these features kind of taken as a whole makes the Horner OCS all-in-one controllers uniquely qualified to solve a variety of application problems uh, where a traditional PLC, yeah, it might fall a little bit short. So some of these example applications, and we're gonna go through these individually, um, are listed here showing what we can do with this series of tools in our multi-tool to solve problems uh, in a typical automation application. So again, the idea being, we want you to think of using an OCS in an application where otherwise you might use some specialty device. But because the OCS is so versatile, you can use our product instead, and it can help you out by not requiring you to learn so many different automation devices. You need a PID controller, well, you can go use an off-the-shelf dedicated PID controller, or you can use the Horner OCS product. You need to do some production monitoring uh, to come up with machine efficiency statistics on your plant floor. You can buy a specialized product for that, or you can apply an OCS, which you already know, to solve that particular need. So that's really what we're talking about today, using the OCS in a variety of non-traditional ways uh, at least in terms of how you would traditionally utilize a PLC. So let's dive into the first application. Let's talk about using the Horner OCS controller as a PID controller or a temperature controller, which is really the same thing. Today, of course, you can use a PLC to do PID solving. Many, many process applications utilize PLCs um, with PID loops built into them uh, to solve that application. But in a lot of cases, maybe you've got an application or a part of a machine or a part of a process where you would otherwise think about using a specialty PID controller that only does PID control because you don't necessarily need the other functionality that a PLC would bring along with it. So you'd consider using a dedicated PID controller. And those are, are certainly worthy products in a lot of ways. However, there are some real advantages to using a Horner OCS uh, instead of a PID controller. And let's talk about a few of those. First of all, a lot of PID controllers have very cryptic uh, user interfaces. They may have a three or four button interface of some sort with a seven or eight segment display. Uh, many are more capable than that, but, but a lot of the traditional PID controllers have a pretty crude operator interface. Well, it's really nice with a Horner OCS to effectively set up the screen to be much more user-friendly. Take advantage of the touchscreen, uh, make it much simpler to monitor the process, to adjust set points, adjust parameters, whatever the case may be. You're not necessarily locked into having to remember what button to press when um, and to go through some complicated process. Another limitation that a lot of PID controllers have is they're kind of limited in the types of networks they support. They're getting better, uh, but still, they're usually pretty limited in terms of how you connect to them. Some of them, you're pretty much just limited to Modbus at this stage still. Well, of course, with a Horner OCS, you've got a variety of ways to interface with our product. We can uh, very neatly interface with Rockwell Logics processors uh, by directly exchanging global tags uh, or as being a high-tech Ethernet I.O. device hanging off of Ethernet IP we can interface with a whole variety of other third-party products over Modbus TCP and a definitely uh, emerging protocol that's been around for a few years but is really taking hold in the building automation market and that's BACnet, building automation and control. So if you have a temperature control loop or multiple loops uh, that are related to building automation or a facility type automation type application, uh, the Horner OCS can get that temperature loop directly interfacing with the building automation uh, and the building manager uh, type software uh, over BACnet. So again, communications is another real, real ability that the OCS has over your typical PID controller. And frankly, as a PID controller, it has a lot of capability, especially when you take a look at, let's say, the, the Model 6 I.O. option for the XL series available in all XL series products. Uh, that IO mix built in gives you six high resolution flexible analog inputs 
that can be thermocouples, RTDs, uh, high resolution, four to 20 milliamps, zero to 10 volts. It also gives you four analog outputs that you might use for things like proportional valves for controlling, let's say, uh, uh, you know, uh, a gas type application. But you can still also very often utilize uh, digital outputs for on off control of, of heating coils, for instance, for heating applications. So the Model 6 I.O. specifically uh, has enough built in I.O. to handle at least six PID loops internally. And if you utilize remote I.O., uh, you can go with up to 32 loops total. Even in our entry level uh, micro series, you don't have the same flexibility in terms of temperature sensors. You have some limited RTD capability. But if what you're looking at, let's say, is a pressure loop, and you don't need extremely high resolution, let's say 12 bits analog resolution will do, uh, then you could very easily have uh, two to four loops of standard PID control done in the micro series as well. So again, as a PID or temperature controller, the OCS is a good option. Uh, certainly there's more configuration that needs to be required. It's not as plug and play as a PID, an off the shelf PID block will be. Uh, but you also don't have the limitations that you'll find with those uh, dedicated controllers. Okay, so here's uh, the first of our Swiss Army knife type applications. All right, next let's take a look at using the OCS as a protocol converter. Now, there is still a tremendous amount of automation equipment already installed in the field, or maybe older devices that haven't been updated, that have a wide variety of different ways to communicate with them, or they have a very limited <laughs> way of communicating with them. You know, maybe it's a, a legacy PLC that you've got installed or a really low cost variable frequency drive that only supports Modbus. Maybe it's a barcode scanner or something that's very limited in terms of, of what it actually can do. Well, trying to get information from some of those more limited devices uh, into some of the more high technology products like you know some of the uh, some of the newer high-end PLCs and PACs, it can be a challenge. So using the OCS as a protocol converter is a pretty darn good option. First of all, you've got a whole bunch of different ways that you can interface with these devices. Each OCS, no matter how low end, has at least two serial ports, one RS232, and one RS-485. We support a variety of different protocols, you know, not just Modbus, but some legacy PLC protocols, as well as, you know, GPS protocols and a variety of other protocols. And in addition to our serial-based protocols, we support, you know, Ethernet protocols, Modbus TCP, Ethernet IP, and others, um, and some CAN-based protocols. So I mentioned earlier that OCS is often used in mobile-type applications, and shipboard applications because we support the local native protocol that you'll find on engine control modules for diesel type engines. We also support can open very well, which you'll find on a variety of third party devices, drives, etc. So there's a whole lot of ways that you can communicate with these devices very flexibly with an OCS. And then we make it very easy for you to, uh, after you've retrieved that data from these devices, to make it available either to be pulled from a SCADA package or you know, a third-party PLC over Modbus TCP. Maybe uh, it's available uh, as, again, high-speed real-world I.O. over Ethernet IP, or maybe it's a direct transfer using global tags with a Rockwell Logic CPU. Those are all ways in which we can get this information from some of these more limited devices uh, and make them available to some of those newer type, higher end uh, type PLC type products. So again, using the Horner OCS as a protocol converter is a pretty good option. All right, now let's talk about data logging. This is an area where you'll find that many manufacturers are looking to do more than just machine control now. Uh, they also want to you know, log information from their equipment. Let me give an example. A few years ago, uh, we started working with a manufacturer, a company that had grown significantly over time, but they had grown organically. Uh, they had a very limited amount of automation in their facility, and they were starting to sell their products to larger customers. 
you know, major automotive manufacturers, et cetera. And those larger customers had much more significant requirements in terms of being able to uh, audit uh, information and production runs uh, that this manufacturer had done in terms of when they were producing product for them. So at any time, uh, these larger customers could, could come in and request to audit and to be sure and to see the, the documentation that uh, the products that had been manufactured were all within tolerance and had fallen within tolerance when they were manufactured. So this customer of ours, which was the manufacturer, they were having to walk around with uh, effectively clipboards and logging the information and the key process data for their equipment because they just didn't have any automation. So what we were able to do was to help them utilize the OCS as a data logger to handle this data logging on a more automatic basis. And they were able to get this up and running very quickly. That was the other key thing. So they did not replace the automation that was manufacturing their products, but they simply bolted a small Horner controller in a box to the side of their machines. Quickly hooked up a couple of key signals, you know, monitoring temperature, pressure, whatever the case may be. And then literally within a day, they were automatically logging these key process parameters locally to a memory card uh, into a format which they could directly import into Excel. Right off the bat, they didn't necessarily network all the machines together. Uh, their goal was to very quickly start logging data automatically. And so in the short term, they were literally, you know, once a day, once a week, pulling out memory cards and manually uh, loading the files. Over time, uh, they networked the equipment to their Ethernet network, and they were able to retrieve data on a more automatic basis through email and through FTP. So this is just one example of how utilizing the Horner OCS strictly for data logging can be a real solution for some of these problems. Literally, you can get data logging working in the Horner OCS in a matter of minutes. There are a couple of dialog boxes to fill in, just a few parameters, um, and you can very quickly grab the key process data uh, or the key uh, IO point data that you want to log, configure how often it's logged or if it's logged on an event or a triggered basis. I um, mean, the next thing you know, you've got data in the form of spreadsheet compatible files. So again, data logging is a great Swiss Army knife type application for the OCS. Uh, whether you're taking data once per second for up to 100 variables, or maybe if you're logging significantly less than that, or even on maybe on a more occasional basis, but logging data every scan. So very capable capability in our product for data logging. Okay, the next application we're gonna talk about, kind of Swiss Army knife application, is for remote alarm enunciation. Now I'm showing my age here, but early in my career, I'll say 30 years ago or 20 years ago, it was very common to find dedicated enunciator type devices, which might be installed at a remote site of some sort. Uh, they would typically have the ability to connect a couple of dry contacts to this custom box. And then there would be an old fashioned phone line type connection. And they would uh, effectively page somebody um, or dial a number whenever there was an alarm condition. Now, even though those devices have gone the way of, by the dodo bird, um, the requirement is still there. There's still a need for remote sites to be able to monitor signals, whether they be dry contacts or whether they be temperature or pressure signals, whatever the case may be, and let somebody know if an alarm condition occurs. So using the Horner OCS as a remote alarm enunciator is a great application. You can take advantage of the ability built into the OCS of its alarm handler. You can utilize the logic uh, to set up some simple ladder logic to test uh, various inputs or signals to determine when you have an alarm condition. It's not strictly just a dry contact, of course, because you've got the ability to set whatever logic you want. Once you've got your alarm set up, uh, you can utilize email to send email enunciations whenever you have an alarm condition so that somebody remotely can see that they've got an alarm. Furthermore, you could take advantage of WebMI 
and provide some built-in screens that could be accessed remotely uh, through the WebMI over a mobile device, let's say, so that they could quickly get back into the system, maybe to acknowledge the alarm or to get a few more details on what's happening at the site before they head to the site if that's what's required. So again, replacing kind of a old-fashioned device where the device has gone obsolete, but the need has not, um, an alarm enunciator, that's a great application for a horn or OCS. All right, now let's talk about a way that our product has been used, which has been used this way by many customers in a plant environment for sure. And that is as an in-plant machine monitor. This is a scenario where you typically would have a manufacturer that's got a, a wide variety of equipment in their plant uh, of different vintages, uh, some highly automated, some not, a whole variety of different brands, just a mix and match of different equipment. And this equipment needs support, whether that's from maintenance personnel, you know, if it stops running for a mechanical reason, maybe it's material handling personnel, if it needs additional material, maybe it's out of material. There's a variety of uh, personnel in any plant that need to support a machine. And as we all know, uh, there is an effort going on to minimize how many people are actually supporting these machines. Uh, because, you know, let's face it, people cost money. So nowadays you've got more and more machines supported by fewer and fewer people. So a lot of customers in that environment have utilized uh, the OCS as a machine monitor. So uh, they effectively, again, are not replacing the controls on their machine but they're bolting an OCS mounted in a small panel to the side of the machine, uh, adding a stack light so that, you know, at a glance, they can look down the row, maybe a row of 20, 30 machines and quickly see the status of those machines just, just visually. Many times they connect them up to a few key signals uh, on the machine, you know, maybe a run signal, uh, maybe one of the, a few of the process signals, whatever the case may be. Many times they're, they're connected to the plant network, uh, usually wired, but not always. Uh, sometimes it's wirelessly through, you know, either the plant wireless network, maybe one of our new Wi-Fi dongles. Um, and they have the ability now for the machine itself to very quickly notify the personnel that are supporting that machine whenever a condition occurs that requires immediate attention. Again, it could be a mechanical issue that has caused the machine to stop running. It could be a material handling issue or a material supply issue. The, the uh, machine is out of equipment. For some other type issue, an operator can locally enter in a reason code using the built-in touchscreen, so that information can be enunciated as well, um, typically over email or through the stack light, you know, with limited uh, details there, of course. And then some of these customers have utilized WebMI to take advantage of uh, especially in very large facilities that are large, you know, geographically, you know, maybe a facility is, you know, 40, 50 acres of equipment and they want to be able to get into the machine a little bit to get more detail so they can utilize WebMI to get more, more information. So as an in-plant machine monitor, uh, again, you're not controlling the machine directly. You could, but in this scenario, this application, you're bolting an additional OCS on the machine um, not wanting to mess with the controls, but wanting to add additional ability to monitor and support that machine in a more automatic fashion. Now, a variation on that previous application, now we're looking at a scenario where let's say instead of monitoring a machine in plant, now we're monitoring a machine remotely from outside the plant. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a facility that on the weekends uh, has a limited series of personnel that are supporting it, and they wanna have the ability to automatically notify those remote people uh, when, it, when you know, a situation occurs that requires their attention. And in this scenario, it's very much like the in-plant scenario, except typically you're going to have to bridge the firewall to get information back and forth. So in these scenarios, very often, not always, but very often a third party device will need to be added you know, from somebody like Sekamia or MB Connect or E1 or Tazibox um, to ver so that you can safely uh, ensure that only plant personnel that are authorized are effectively receiving the messages and then moving back across the firewall 
to investigate what's happening. So again, this is very much like the previous example, but really more uh, to the order of remote notification of problems to personnel that are outside of the facility. A third application that's related to machine monitoring, remember we just re reviewed two, an in-plant machine monitor for support purposes, an out-of-plant machine monitor for support purposes. Now this third application is a machine monitor for the purposes of production data gathering for measuring key machine utilization statistics. You can only improve your machine utilization and your overall equi equipment effectiveness if you measure it, because whatever you don't measure, you can't improve. So OEE, overall equipment effectiveness, is something that many customers want to be able to uh, measure on their equipment, and their equipment is uh, again, a variety of vintages, some highly automated, some not. So one of the options for measuring uh, OEE is to buy some very specialized and expensive device to bolt on the side of your machine uh, that can help you measure these statistics. Well, you can do the same thing by bolting a Horner OCS to the side of the machine and tying it to you know, key machine signals, run signals, et cetera. So you're counting parts and you're measuring uptime and all the things that you need, you know, in some cases, automatically measuring quality, getting the information you need so that you can generate these OEE type numbers, log them locally, and then also report them, you know, maybe to another system elsewhere uh, in the plant. It's another possible case where WebMI can be used either to remotely view you know, what's going on on the piece of equipment um, or to get in and make adjustments, uh, see reports, those sorts of things. Uh, using the OCS as a production monitor is kind of really another way of utilizing uh, the Horner all-in-one controllers in a plant environment uh, for kind of a non-traditional application. All right, now let's take a look at using the Horner OCS as an edge device to gather data from the factory floor through a variety of different means, and then pushing a set of that data, a subset of that data, up to uh, either a private data server that's compatible with MQTT, um, or maybe a cloud-based server. And then with that data now available through a MQTT broker or MQTT server, that data can then be retrieved and analyzed by either custom dashboard type solution or an off the shelf type solution. So really what we're talking about here is instead of using a dedicated customized edge device, which is really just designed to communicate up to either a cloud or a local server, utilize the Horner OCS instead. Now the first part of the job is gathering the data and the OCS is really uniquely qualified to do that well. I mean, some of the data that you're gathering from the factory floor may be in the form of direct signals, temperatures, run signals, digital signals of various types, pressures, whatever the case may be. Some of that information may need to be gathered the old fashioned way through instrumentation. And in that scenario, that instrumentation can be wired directly to the IO that's built into the OCS. Another way of gathering data on the factory floor is to get it over a network, whether that's serially over RS-45 or RS-232, maybe from some sort of legacy PLC, for instance, or maybe over Ethernet uh, from some other PLC uh, that talks maybe Modbus TCP uh, or Ethernet IP or one of the other common factory networks. So there's a whole variety of ways of gathering the data locally on the factory floor, and then utilizing MQTT, you can push that up to a broker slash server, where again, it can later be viewed and, and analyzed using some sort of solution. Now, another capability the OCS has, which is really important, is the ability to locally, historically log the information that is being passed upstream, just in case you have a scenario where the communications channel is broken. So you don't want to necessarily lose the data during a communications outage. You want to be able to take that live data and you know, historically record it, say, to a memory card, 
And then later when the communications is restored, taking that information and sending it upstream kind of after the fact. So because the OCS has that you know, local data logging type capability and local storage capability beyond just what's stored in its memory location, um, that's another key capability that makes the OCS a good choice in this particular application. Okay, so instead of using a dedicated edge device, uh, you have the option in many cases to utilize a Horner OCS for that job instead. Here's another application. The next few applications are ones where sometimes you might consider using a PLC, but we think that there's some pretty compelling reasons why an OCS would be a better choice. So let's start look at you know, remote level monitoring, like for instance, where you might have a tank farm or something like that. We've got a whole variety of all-in-one controllers that have some really nice capabilities for this application. First of all, you've got the built-in I.O. to interface with let's say a traditional ultrasonic sensor or some other sensor that has an analog type interface, or if it has some sort of factory network type interface, we can interface that way as well. So there's a whole lot of ways to get that, you know, level information into the OCS locally there uh, on the tank or, you know, at, uh, in the field, if you will. Also, uh, the OCS products are very good from an environmental standpoint, so they've got very good environmental specs, so it makes some sense to go ahead and put them out, uh, out where the equipment is. We've also got a really nice Wi-Fi dongle available. There are certain, uh, certainly cases where tank farms are in a campus type scenario, not, not a college scenario, but a campus type scenario where there is a campus Wi-Fi network already established that could be tapped into or utilized to report the data, or in a lot of other cases, there are dedicated 900 megahertz type modems that are available that can interface with the OCS as well uh, for getting that data to the centralized location where they're monitored. And then again, we've got built-in alarm handling capability with the OCS, so you can utilize WebMI possibly for uh, you know the alarm handling, you know whether it be you know, sending the email through just traditional email type feature, or whether it being using WebMI to provide additional information um, after the fact, there's a whole variety of ways to, um, to communicate what's happening on a regular basis and also on an exception basis. So remote level and take monitoring is a really nice application for an OCS. A, a lot of variable frequency drives, of course, are used with PLCs. So I'm not implying that, um, uh, that you wouldn't use a PLC with a variable frequency drive type application, whether it's pump control or, or some other VFD type application. However, there are, again, some unique capabilities in the OCS that make it very well suited in those applications where maybe interfacing with a variable frequency drive is one of the primary tasks of the application. The OCS can communicate with drives a, a whole variety of ways whether that be through hardwired signals, you know, digital inputs and outputs, uh, analog inputs and outputs, whether it be over some sort of uh, network, maybe RS-485 Modbus, maybe CAN Open. Um, there are a variety of ways to interface with one or more drives and performing local monitoring and control, maybe utilizing PID. Again, the Horner OCS products can support anywhere from four to 32 PID loops depending on the product. So by using a Horner OCS controller to interface directly with the drive and doing the local control, now that uh, information uh, is available uh, to be posted where it can be retrieved by larger PLCs in the system. Maybe a Rockwell Logix processor might be gathering the data over Ethernet IP, or maybe we might be exchanging data directly you know, over, you know, global tags in the Logic CPU. But now with a little bit of local logic, uh, we're doing local control uh, at or close to the VFDs and exchanging things like set points and process status uh, with the larger um, supervising PLC. So again, utilizing a Horner OCS in any application where there are available frequency drives is really a good choice. Um, and then making that information available to higher level systems such as SCADA packages and larger PLCs or supervising PLCs 
um, is another good solution as well. I mean, there aren't as many options in terms of building automation uh, networks. So again, let's not forget about doing local PID control with a Horner OCS controller, and then making that data available to the building management system over BACnet. One application we often don't think about anymore because we often think about the fact that there aren't that many of these systems out there still, but they're, they're out there. And that is using a Horner OCS to replace a system that is based on hardwired controls, push buttons, pilot lights, relay, timer-based relays, you know, standard control relays, you know, replacing those products with a X4, for instance, which is a really cost-effective product with a really nice operator interface that can talk to larger PLCs, such as Rockwell PLCs and others over Ethernet IP, um, is a really nice solution. And when you have an X4, that can be a pretty compelling uh, reason to take a fairly obsolete uh, part of uh, or piece of equipment that's relay and push button based, uh, modernize it, uh, get it hanging off the ethernet network, give it flexibility and moving on from there. So again, as these, uh, especially with the advent of the micro OCS series, a lot of the capabilities that traditionally were only available in mid-sized PLCs are now available with really nice HMIs uh, and upper interfaces, uh, still with some nice network connectivity uh, with, a, with, again, a great looking screen. So let's not forget about uh, push button and relay replacement. Okay, now a couple other applications I'll go through here quickly. Let's talk about lighting control. As many of you know, uh, Horner Automation uh, has a sister division, the Horner Lighting Group. Um, we're under the same roof and we're very proud of the accomplishments that we both have made over the years, both in lighting as well as automation. And more and more, our automation products are used in conjunction with our lighting products for a whole variety of reasons. Using the, the Horner controller as a lighting controller, um, first of all, it's got all the I.O. that you could possibly need to effectively control the lighting, whether that be you know, monitoring you know, the analog inputs that might be required to monitor uh, ambient light for ambient light harvesting type applications, uh, to you know, analog outputs that are used for dimming control in a lot of cases. Um, we've got a variety of ways of interfacing with lighting. You can utilize smart rail, a whole bank of smart rail blocks to interface with a large bank of, of lights, for instance, and very easily interconnect all the smart rail I.O. blocks with an OCS that's doing the control uh, by daisy chaining an ethernet signal. Uh, or, or Cat5 wiring, as the case may be. So there's just a lot of capability in terms of connectivity with lighting control. And then of course, the flexibility of doing scheduling, of doing zone control, of automatically handling facilities after hours, uh, automatically dimming uh, sections of the plant that are you know, not occupied at the time, um, and interfacing with the building management system um, over BACnet or another protocol um, is another big plus. So again, more and more of our controls are used in lighting applications, whether or not they utilize our lights or not, uh, but we've got a, a, a variety of great lighting solutions as well, uh, not just on the automation side. And then another application that people don't always think about where a Horner OCS could be a really good solution would be a, a plant HVAC type system you know, where you've got a variety of equipment that needs to be needs to be controlled and monitored, you know, whether that be, you know, a whole variety of different temperatures that have to be monitored, dampers that need to be adjusted, blowers and fans that have to be controlled. Um, all the capabilities we've talked about in these other applications, the great interface with variable frequency drives, uh, the ability to have the IO either built in or remote or both, the support for BACnet and interfacing with building management systems, these also not only make for great um, lighting control applications, but also HVAC control as well. Okay, so hopefully uh, you found those applications that I reviewed 
kind of eye-openers a little bit, or at least get you thinking about some of the different ways you can utilize our all-in-one control products outside of the traditional PLC and HMI type applications. All right, let's go ahead and get to, get to the questions. Okay, the first question uh, is from Carlos. Uh, you mentioned shipboard automation as an example of applications for Excel series. Would you please elaborate on any certification the product has? Okay, so the XLE, XL4, and I believe the XL7 all have shipboard certification. I'll have to pull out that specific one. My brain is fading here, but, um, but some of the models do have a certification for use on board the ship. They can only be used in certain applications, but they're very often used to interface with diesel engines and other type systems for uh, you know monitoring uh, systems on the ship. They're also very often used for temperature control, um, and other environmental control as well. Um, but I'll look up that specific um, certification before the end of the program. I apologize, it slipped, slipped my mind here. Um, Peter asked, any plans for Profinet support? Um, we don't have anything in the short-term roadmap. It's something we're keeping an eye on, uh, but we currently don't have support for Profinet. I could see us supporting that at some time um, relatively soon, but I wouldn't anticipate anything for the first half of 2021 for sure. Um, had, a, had a question from Adnan who is asking about, he'd like to hear a little more information about protocol conversion. So in general, when we're talking protocol conversion, what we're really looking at is kind of two steps. The first step is to gather information from connected devices. Okay, and to do that, we typically do that using um, what we call downloadable protocols. So these are most often client protocols, you know, Modbus TCP client. That's what, that's the, the best example, for instance. But there's the other protocols we support as well. Um, the traditional serial protocols for interfacing with older PLCs, like um, the old Rockwell DF1 protocol, the old GE Series 90 protocol. Um, we support some of the Mitsubishi legacy protocols. So the first step would be to effectively set up a polling scheme where you are polling data from some of these legacy devices over one of these uh, downloadable protocols, whether it be Modbus or SNP, DF1, those sorts of things. Um, and effectively, you're gathering that data into local memory of the OCS, into its local register table. And then at that stage, the data is in the OCS, and you're either going to just make it available for upstream devices to retrieve on their own, or you might have a little bit of manipulation of the data that you might wanna do. It's possible you might wanna grab the data um, you know, from these legacy devices, and then you might want to scale it, or you might want to you know, do some sort of algorithm on it, and then you could use the ladder logic, of course, built in to, to do that, to do that job. And then now you've got this information, whether it be the raw information or the manipulated information that is sitting in OCS register space. Now, let's, let me give you a couple different ways where that data could be retrieved from, say, a higher level device like uh, Logic's uh, CPU, in our case of a Rockwell, or maybe, maybe a SCADA package or something like that. One way would be, for instance, in the case of a Logix processor, you could utilize Ethernet IP as long as the data that is being retrieved fits within you know, 128 words in and 128 words out. If it doesn't fit within that envelope, then you can also use what we call Logix tag exchange protocol, where effectively you import uh, the L5K file from the Logix processor into the OCS, and then effectively you map the global tags that are in the Logix processor to the data that you've retrieved from these legacy devices. And it may be a case of, you know, obviously adding tags on the Logix side, Logix CPU side, before you actually, you know, export the L5K file. So that's really the two steps. Retrieve the data, possibly manipulate it, or at least manipulate some of it, and then make it available to be retrieved 
from say a logics processor over ethernet IP or global tag exchange, or let's say over Modbus TCP, where you can specify based on which registers the data is located, specifically which Modbus registers uh, need to be accessed to read and write the data from the OCS. So that's effectively the process we're talking about. As a protocol converter, do any of your units work with Profibus? Great question. The XL series through an add-on device, which is made by Horner, it adds on uh, under the hood, if you will, as a kind of a field option, field installed option. There's a Profibus slave option available for the XL series. So any XL series OCS, XL4, XL, EXL6, XLEE, you can add this Profibus slave option to the back of the unit, and now we are a Profibus slave. So that would be a way, for instance, of um, making data available from you know legacy devices that don't support Profibus and making it available over Profibus you know from the OCS. We don't directly have Profibus master for the OCS, at least not through a built-in option. Now there are third-party devices. Uh, from people like HMS, for instance, and Hillshire, uh, which are effectively, um, they have Ethernet support on one side that would interface with the OCS, and they have Profibus master support on the other side, which would interface with the field Profibus devices. Through those third-party HMS and Hillshire devices, now you could have the Horner OCS act as a Profibus master, but we don't have anything built in or anything manufactured directly by us to solve that. Is it possible for the user to create custom templates or custom display screens? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, but yes, it is uh, to a certain extent. So you can create a screen, let's say for a PID loop, let's say build a screen that may you know, give you the set point and the process variable. Maybe it's got a bar graph to show some information. Maybe there's uh, data fields on there for a, a adjusting the tuning parameters, whatever, however you want to set that up, you could create a screen on say uh, XL4 or an EXL6 or something like that. You could set up the screen exactly the way you want. And then effectively you can create what's called a group. And then effectively you group all those objects on the screen and then save it as a group. And then if you have additional PID loops that you need to support, you can effectively just load that screen group into a new screen. And then now you've got the ability to have more of a, a, a pre-designed PID interface where all you have to do is go in and you know change the uh, IO references for the new PID loop. Now, one of the things we don't have yet, which we are working on for uh, Seascape 10 and beyond, is the ability to um, have groups of graphic objects where you can, strictly by copying and pasting, more easily uh, change over the um, the I/O references, but that's something that uh, that we're working on uh, to make even better for uh, Seascape 10 and beyond. What is the cost of an MQTT license for an OCS, and can this easily be added at a later stage, or do we have to order it when we order the OCS? That's a great that's a great question. Okay, so MQTT is a licensed feature. So it's a feature that doesn't necessarily come built into every XL series OCS. It's First of all, you can only use it from the XL4 on up. So it's not compatible with the XLEE or the XLTE. Um, it's, not, it's not compatible with the micro series either, except for the X5. So XL4 on up and the X5 give you the option to support MQTT. Now it's very inexpensive. Um, it is less than $100 list price for licensing a unit to support MQTT. So that's really cost effective. And you can either add the license while the unit is in your possession, say in the shop, um, if you're an OEM, or you can add the license later in the field. So you do have the option of, uh, of doing either. Now, when you do set it up, there will be some Seascape changes required. So you will, of course, have to have access to the unit so you can modify the program in addition to licensing it. In the case of pushing data to the web, so we're talking about MQTT here, this is the next question. Uh, does it know when the communications is lost and then send whatever was, was lost automatically? Or do you have to know when you lost it and go back and try and get it off the SD, et cetera, et cetera? So 
I don't have that answer off the top of my head. Certainly, you can ensure that the data is not lost by logging it to the local memory card. And then depending on the setup of the broker, you should be able to set up a way of having, um, as soon as communications is established. Now, the loss of communications is known. Let me get that straight first. So both sides know when communication is lost. The broker knows, as well as the OCS that is acting as an MQTT device. So both sides know when communications is lost. So there's no question about that. So the OCS knows when it loses communication. In terms of the exact steps to get that data pushed up to uh, the broker after communications is reestablished, that's something I'll have to follow up on. I don't think the process is fully automatic, um, but I think it also depends partially on how you set up the broker. Is the 32 gigabyte micro SD card size still the limit for all OCS controls? Okay, so the older products, when I say older products, I'm talking about products that were sold say 10 years ago that had micro SD on them. Those products were limited to two gigabytes. All newer, like products, all the products that have been sold in the last, let's say, three to five years, those products, those are supporting at least 32 gigabyte cards. Now, what do we mean by at least? When you buy a memory card, a micro SD memory card that's 32 gigabytes or smaller, it comes from, it comes out of the box formatted for FAT, which we're compatible with. If you buy a card that's 64 gigs or larger, it comes formatted in XFAT, which we're not compatible with and has a pretty onerous licensing requirement from Microsoft. Now, a lot of companies are being illegal and ignoring the license requirements, but we don't do that. That's not ethical and we don't do that. So the answer is yes, you can use 64 gig and larger cards with our products, but you will need to format the cards for fat before you can use them. And to do that, you'll have to do it in a like in a computer or something. And as an example, Windows 10, the last time I looked, did not have built into its operating system the ability to format uh, an XFAT card into FAT. So you'll need a third party utility, which you can find for free on the web. So that was kind of a long answer. The real answer is we can support, support cards larger than 32 gigs, but you'll have to for, format them externally with some sort of third party formatting tool uh, before you can use them. Is it possible to raise the limit of the multi-rotate instruction past the max length of 2,048 words? I would say that is the current requirement or current limit. Uh, that's something we'll need to follow up on. That's a feature request. Seems reasonable. Let me go ahead and um, take a note there and we'll follow up and make, it, make an official feature request to expand the multi-rotate beyond 2048. Does the OCS have any intrinsically safe outputs or modules? No, it does not. Nothing that you would buy from us directly. Um, if you have any kind of intrinsically safe requirements, um, you'll need to buy a third party device that will interface with our products. And there's plenty of them available out there. Ah, thank you, Jim. Jim helped me out by letting me know that the shipboard approval from our first question of the session is ABS. So ABS is the approval that is found on several of the XL series products, certainly on the XLE, XL4, and XL7, um, and maybe a few of the others, uh, but ABS, the American Bureau of Shipping, I think is what it stands for, uh, but that approval is there for, um, for those products. Had a question. Again, we're answering any questions we can. Any news in relation to the new OCS remote I.O. system? It's called OCS I.O. Uh, we will have a webinar where we'll, we'll give you an update on that in January. So it's moving along. OCS I.O. is a new remote I.O. system. It does not replace any of our existing systems. It augments them. Um, and we'll cover that. We'll give you an update. And that update is basically telling you it's going to be pretty close to shipping uh, in the January timeframe, or at least in the first quarter for sure. 
Are the tags from the AB logics imported for use in the OCS? Yes, they can be. The way that works is uh, you, you save the L5K file from the logic CPU, you know, using the, the, the Rockwell software suite. And then you take that L5K file and you import it into the OCS. It's in the, I believe it's in the program menu uh, in the main section of the Seascape uh, programming software. I believe under the program menu, you'll find import L5K data is the option there. And it gives you the ability to effectively map the logics tags, the global logics tags, uh, over into OCS memory space if you choose, or if you don't go to the trouble of actually mapping them to specific registers, you can effectively still read and write logics tag data from the OCS screen through graphics objects. How do you recommend OCS devices communicate with each other? Great question. Well, I've got a couple recommendations for you. Now the, the long answer, which I'm not gonna give, the long, long answer is it depends but I have, I have three quick recommendations. The first is, if you're looking at, say, big chunks of data, say a few hundred registers that you want, or a few hundred variables that you want to exchange from, from OCS to OCS, or from one OCS to a bunch of OCSs, I would recommend a protocol called Ethernet Global Data, sometimes called EGD. Um, it's based on UDP protocol, and it's great for moving big chunks of data quickly and efficiently. Um, so I would definitely recommend, when well, I say efficiently, I don't necessarily mean it, it's easy on bandwidth, but, but it's still a very efficient protocol. So EGD would be one recommendation over Ethernet for sure. Um, another recommendation would be if you're just exchanging some data and not all that frequently or on an occasional basis, then you can go ahead and use Modbus TCP. And what you can do in that scenario is the Horner device that's gonna be doing the polling, that's gonna act as the Modbus client or master as we sometimes call it, you would effectively configure which uh, registers uh, you wanna read and write from the server OCSs, and you don't have to switch over to Modbus register space. You can just use native addressing to read and write R's and M's and T's and all that sort of thing. So via ethernet, my primary recommendation is EGD. Secondary, if it's occasional, is Modbus TCP. And then CAN's also a good option. There's some scenarios where you don't wanna use Ethernet for a variety of reasons, um, where maybe you want a daisy chain type scenario, uh, maybe it's a really noisy environment, maybe there isn't an Ethernet network available. Um, so C-SCAN is a really good way of exchanging data as well, um, you know, up to limits. You know, you're not gonna exchange hundreds and hundreds of, of um, variables over C-SCAN but um, that would be my other recommendation. Um, let's see, is there a way to compare two Horner logic programs for differences? We have a verify function, but it only tells you whether the two programs match or don't match. It doesn't give you more details than that. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you there. Uh, I did get some uh, backup from my, uh, my colleagues from my engineering team that said, uh, there's definitely retained data for MQTT and birth and death certificates for disconnects, no question. Um, so that kind of backs up the information I gave that we certainly both sides know when communication is lost over MQTT. Um, I need to do a little more research though on how the uh, how data is caught up though uh, after communications is restored. I believe that is the last question. Um, thank you for spending part of your Veterans Day with me. And for those of you who are veterans, let me once again, thank you for your service to uh, our country. So everybody have a great, great day. And thanks again for joining us.